So, hey, Glenn, how are you doing? I'm, I'm really well, thank you. So Glenn is a new friend. I had multiple people the last couple of years, you know, Bob Donnell and Mike Muni uh, say, you got to meet this Glenn Morshauer that lives in the Dallas area. And I don't know if they'd ever told you that, Glenn, that you should meet me, but I've definitely been told I needed to meet you. And it finally happened. Ken Walls, uh, I was actually a guest on your show, your and Ken's show. And I had the best time. It, it, you guys, you have a lot of fun. We have large quantities of fun. That's true. <laughs> and, you know, Glenn, you might recognize him from the show 24. You might recognize him from three of the Transformer movies. He's been in hundreds of films and shows. And uh, he's also an entrepreneur. He has an acting school. He's a speaker. And he literally blew our mind. I had him on a, a inner circle call. And we, you know, we, we've had them all. We've had Brian Tracy, Mark Victor Hansen, so many... You guys got to experience uh, less than time. So I'm setting the bar really high here for you, Glenn. Uh, but I know good, you're not where I like it. Okay, good. But Glenn just spoke philosophy. It reminded me of Jim Rohn. It reminded me of, and I call it wisdom. You know, he just shared wisdom. He shared truth. And Glenn, there are so many things you have shared on that call and on the call I was with you and Ken that I own it. I mean, impossible, possible, probable, inevitable, you know, goodbye, I'm new. I'll or, cover all of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So amazing stuff. So I want to, I, I can either interview you or I can turn it over to you. How about I just turn it over to you, my friend? Uh, that's great. Well, I'm, we'll, I'm here to serve in whatever capacity you, you see best. Okay. Well, we have an amazing group of entrepreneurs with us today. And you just feel free to share and then we'll open it up for Q and A and I can always come in and ask questions too. So however you're led, go for it, my friend. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Kyle. I'm honored to be here and I am here to, um, to love and I am here to help. And I am also here to French fry the circuitry of your brain, uh, in a good way, in a really good way. Um, I will zip through my backstory, which is that I was born here in Dallas, I grew up, became an actor when I was 11 years old because I was inspired by a performance that I saw at the Dallas Theater Center and started training as a theater actor. And by the time I was uh, 15, I had decided that my uh, life was going to be spent in New York City and would live the life of a stage actor or so I thought. And then uh, later that year at age 15, I started doing television commercials and uh, really became fond of this concept of residuals. Um, that was a lifestyle that, that really worked for me, the idea of being paid and then repaid later down the line for work that I had already done. Um, and within six months time, I wound up with a lead in a movie, having never been in a movie. And that film was a film called Drive-In that we did in the fall of 1975. So that's 45 years ago. My first professional job as an actor was when I was 15 in, um, in April of 75. So last month was my 45th anniversary of doing this as a living. And when I, met, when I went to California, uh, I want to open with this, which is a mindset um, offering, which is that, you know, so often when people decide to go into the uh, field that I went into as an actor, it is modified with terms like starving or struggling. You'll, you'll hear struggling actor and so forth. And I have been coaching this program called the extra mile for many, many years. And one of the things that has been a real takeaway for a lot of people is when I let them know right up front that I'm going to give you two very strong takeaways with regard to the acting profession. One of them is that I stopped auditioning 40 some odd years ago. And that doesn't mean I don't go into those rooms. Uh, I'm just not there to audition. I'm not there to prove. I'm there to express, not impress. And so it's all mindset. I also said, I think the, the single biggest reason that things have gone extremely well for me the entire time I've lived in California. And we only moved back to Texas eight years ago which was a surprise. And we came here because of a declining health situation for my mother-in-law. Uh, but we figured we would just grow old and die in California. And we were very happy out there. Uh, but 
fate took it in a different direction and we're back here now and frankly in love with it because my wife is uh, is from here as well and we broke every rule in the book we we were uh, there's even a case to be made for we did stuff that was really dumb uh as in my wife married an actor someone who dreamt of doing that for a career who did not have a college degree and we got married when we were 19 and 18 and we have now been married 41 years i just turned 61 a couple of weeks ago and carolyn will be 60 in a few months so uh we're still rowing the boat together despite uh, all of the math that would suggest otherwise or suggest that that would be a bad idea and one of the first takeaways i want to offer you today is the single greatest life coaching that I can offer, which is simply this, and it is worth writing down, which is watch how everyone else is doing it, and I'm referring to the masses, watch how everyone else is doing it, and then don't do it that way. I wanna say that one more time, watch how everyone else is doing it, and then don't do it that way. Um, if you're concerned about popularity, you'll wind up with an incredibly mundane life, because life responds to recipes. So if we want to have an extraordinary life, we use extraordinary measures and we use different recipes than are traditional. So I'm not here to refer to the ABCs of life as you will soon see. But when I was 18 and went to California, uh, as I have said to many, many auditoriums full of just actors, I asked them to raise their hands and and uh, identify if you are here tonight, and this is in Los Angeles usually, if you are here in LA tonight to pursue an acting career, raise your hand. If that's what you're in Los Angeles currently doing, uh, please indicate so by raising your hand. And the response to that was 100%, and it always is when I'm talking to actors. So there I'm looking at 100% uh, of an audience that are there to pursue their acting career. And I said, this will make the price of admission worth it, what I'm about to share with you alone, which is that when I moved to California, when I was 18, I didn't move there to pursue a career, I moved there to have one. And I wanna let that sit with everyone. And in fact, I'm gonna go to speaker view, I mean the gallery view rather, because I wanna see if that lands for you in terms of mindset, that it's not about pursuing a career. I did not go there to pursue one. I went there to have one. And that was my claim. Pursuit, it's interesting, is a word that people use when they think there's a fairly good chance they won't catch something. So they're afraid to use stronger language like claim or have. And I can prove it. So anything I say today, I will always back it up with some evidence. Uh, did any of you last night, did any of you pursue dinner? I'm guessing no one pursued dinner. Have you ever called anyone and said, hey, would you like to pursue dinner on Saturday night? Uh, I already know what the answer is. The answer is you never have. You've said rather stronger language. You've said, would you like to have dinner? And so you can see that there is a built-in expectation that dinner is indeed what you will have. But that's because you've already decided that it's entirely available. So it's interesting that anything we can shuffle into that mental file cabinet of seeing it as just as haveable as anything else. By design, it already becomes more haveable. You know, I was a Boy Scout, and the Boy Scouts taught me one of the greatest lessons of my life. And I think actually the, the takeaway was bigger than the intended lesson. I think the intended lesson was addressing the micro, and the takeaway from me showed up in the macro and the micro. And that takeaway was this, they taught us, and many of you, I'm just curious by show of hands, how many of you were in the Scouts? Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts, just the scouting program, good. It looks like maybe a third of you, something like that. Well, one of the great teachings they taught us was to not leave our campsite as clean as it was when we got there, but rather cleaner or better off. And the beautiful, manner in which that understanding poured itself through me was that I understood that on a much different level, which is that we're not just talking about this campsite, that in my mind, the earth is my campsite, that everywhere I go is my campsite. Today, this meeting is my campsite, and I have a commitment to leave it better off than it was had I not come here. 
that's a commitment. I'll tell you what it isn't. It isn't a hope, a wish, or a want. It's a commitment. So I, I refrain from using words like hope, wish, and want. Uh, I usually go to a football analogy. I can imagine a team of professional football players out on the field saying, well, we, we, we certainly hope we'll win today. That's what we're doing. We're going to spend a lot of time hoping. And I can hear a coach coming in. You're also going to spend a lot of time getting your butt kicked, right? So uh, there's not a lot of point in, in sitting around hoping, wishing, and wanting. Claiming will do far more for us in our lives than hoping, wishing, and wanting. Uh, Jim Gardner asked me to tell you guys a story that I will uh, lead with tonight, uh, today. It's, uh, it's an indicator of really sort of how uh, my heart processes life. And it bleeds over into every lesson I've taught in the 36 years that I've been a speaker. Uh, speaking, by the way, these are the waters in which I prefer swimming more than any other area of my life, way more than acting. And life's been very kind to me. I have lived in a land of plenty for a very, very long time. Uh, the television series 24 has opened every door for me career-wise that I could ever dream of. And it's really a privilege to be aboard a program that is seen by millions and millions of viewers every week when we were on the air on Fox and that wherever my wife and I travel in the world, we are treated so beautifully. And more often than not, when people come up to greet us, I tell you, uh, it's a beautiful thing. They want a hug. You guys remember back in the days that we, we had hugs, like just two short months ago? You remember that? Everyone remember hugs? Anyone feeling a little bit of a hug deficit in your life? I'm curious, because that's one of the things I'm really, really missing right now. So this story took place in the fall of 2000. None of it is embellished. And I'll warn you in advance that you may on some level feel as though I need to be institutionalized. And believe me, I'm okay with that uh, opinion. But I checked into a Salt Lake City hotel room. I was there filming a guest star role in a series and uh, walked into room 923. And when I came in there, I opened the door and it turns out I had a roommate, which was bizarre because I've never walked into a room where I had a roommate, having traveled all over the world, I've never experienced this. And my roommate that day was a goldfish. And I walked up to the bowl and I didn't know anyone in Salt Lake City. I'd only been there a couple of times and never for work. I had only been there to the Sun, uh, Sundance Film Festival, but had never gone there to actually shoot uh, a movie or television show. So now I'm in town. I'm at a very nice hotel. It was the Hotel Monaco in downtown. It's where a lot of the sports teams play when they're in town. And so I was um, really excited about the next nine nights that I was going to be spending there. And I just think it's so cool that I have a, a goldfish in my room. So where I may be a little bit different from your average bird is that I walked over to the bowl and I spent about 30 minutes with this fish just staring at him and comparing his world to mine because he's in a little six inch bowl, just a tiny little one. And it's got gravel in it. It's got uh, water in it. Obviously the bowl is made of glass and he has a castle a little bitty castle right in the middle of it. And what, uh, what Gil's life was, was like was just going around and around and around. And with each spin, I'm going to set down my earbuds and show you. I have to act this out for you. But this was Gil's life. Oh, look, a castle. Oh, look, a castle. Oh, look, a castle. And that is what Gil did all day and all night. And I just thought, wow, a uh, better you than me, Gil, because I couldn't, I couldn't do this. I, um, I, on the other hand, uh, woke up in Los Angeles. Uh, the company sent a car to pick me up, took me to Burbank Airport. I went into a cylinder where I flew 500 plus miles per hour to Salt Lake City and then uh, the same to the hotel and then went into an elevator, had a warm hello to the nice lady at the desk and walked in the room and now here we are crossing paths. May I call you Gil? And I said it out loud because that's what I do. That's kind of the way I roll. And I said, do you, do you mind if I call you Gil? Now where this name came from was it was the name that Bill Murray had used for the fish that he hung around his neck in the film, What About Bob? And uh, Gil offered no objection to my proposed 
name. And so we were off and running. And I kind of like the double G, he's Gil, I'm Glenn. And we became buddies that night. Well, I decided to run an experiment with Gil based on the fact that he was in such a confining space. And I took his bowl and I walked him into the bathroom where I promptly filled up the tub and kept checking it, dipping one hand into the bowl and the other into the tub and back and forth, checking the temperature to make sure it was the same because I didn't want to shock Gil, but I just needed to run this experiment to see what a larger environment uh, might do and what effect it would have on him. Well, I scooped Gil up and put him into the center of the bathtub, and I was only going to leave him in this water for a couple of minutes, nothing that would harm him, and here is what he did. This is my impression of Gil. He went just like this. And after a few seconds, he went like this, and then like this, and back and forth with his eyes, and then that familiar pattern started. Now, despite the fact that he had a huge bathtub in which to swim, he remained in that familiar six-inch circle. And I thought, oh, my God, how much like a human being is this? That things have changed, but he's a creature of habit. So I reached in and I gently nudged him outward just a little bit to swim a wider, wider circle and pushed him all the way out to the edge. The theme word here is gently. And I got him to the edge and I thought, you know what? I don't want to traumatize the fish. I think that's enough expansion thinking for this evening. And I scooped him up, put him back in the bowl and put him back up on the dresser. The following night, I did the same thing. And once again, Gil started his circle. I moved him out to the edge and it was beautiful. And I let him swim around. On the third night, when I put Gil in, Gil started the circle and then went to the edge himself. And it was that night that he discovered the concept of the straightaway. And I watched this little fish haul butt up the side and back around going faster and faster and faster. And frankly, I got so excited that I ripped off my own clothes and got in the tub with him. Now I have become Gil's human castle. And he is swimming madly around me, and I'm loving it, and I'm becoming genuinely emotional. And my, my prevailing thought is, where are the witnesses? I need witnesses. I, people have got to see this. It's beautiful. Well, we did this every single night that I was there in Salt Lake City. Gil and I went swimming together. And he understood the routine. By night four, it was into the tub, straight to the edge. I jumped in round and round and round and round. And now it comes time to check out, nine nights later. And it was on that 10th morning, and checkout time was around 11 o'clock, and at about 10 a.m., I looked over at Gil, and I thought, what a beautiful week we have had together. Would you like to take one more swim? And he had never been swimming with me in the day, so I think when I walked him back to the bathroom, and, you know, he's doing like this in the water as we're going back to the, it's like, what, what, we've never done this in the daytime, Glenn. This is unusual, but okay, this is, this is fine. And we got into the tub. And when I got into the tub with Gil this time, I started crying. And here is why I started crying. I started crying because I felt great about the role I had played in his life, that I had expanded his experience. I'd gotten inside his fish brain. And... Then I started thinking about when we get out of this tub, I'm going to be putting him back in that tiny little bowl where he will be stuck forever because here's what I know. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Gil will never have another roommate like me. I'm certain of this, and my tears are real. It is not just a few. I'm very, very emotional about saying so long, which explains why a short 20 minutes later, I was down in the lobby with my suitcase in one hand and Gil in the other. And I looked at the front desk clerk and I said, I realize a lot of people steal your towels, but I'm going to take your goldfish. And she looked at me and we'd gotten to know each other on first name basis. She goes, oh, 
And I said, yeah, we've actually been upstairs in room 923 swimming together in the bathtub every single night that I've been here. And she goes, you know, Glenn, that's, that's just somehow that doesn't surprise me. I said, no, I'm not joking. We've gone swimming in the tub every day and I couldn't stand the thought of leaving him here in the bowl. So just put it on my bill, sell me the glass, sell me the gravel, give me a little extra of fish food, whatever you have. And I'm taking Gil with me, which I did. And we went and bought a tank there with some people I got to know while I was there that week in Salt Lake City. I had someone actually spot me in a theater that wanted me to go visit their acting group and do a Q&A with them. And so with that group, we bought a huge uh, aquarium that was about a foot bigger than the very bathtub in which he had trained. Gill is probably the best known fish in history because I've been talking about him for 20 years. And um, in so many ways, all of us are Gill. So I'm going to ask you today to just consider how wide is the circle you've chosen to swim in? And why have you decided to make it that size? Now, mind you, there is no right or wrong to this. There is no certain size circle. There is no should. I just want you to know that the size of your circle is entirely determined by you and your desires, your soul's desires. I'm going to let that take us to the reason people don't do it. The reason that they don't wind up swimming in a larger, more daring circle uh, than, than Gil did and that many humans do. And it's a thing that I have written down called the dirty dozen. And these are the 12 biggest lies that have ever been told. Now, this program, by the way, is not memorized. This is just something I've talked about for years, but I don't ever use PowerPoint. And most of my talks, especially if I'm doing one of my all day seminars, I never know what's going to pop out of my mouth. And I'm going to try to get these done a little bit faster today because I've got a lot of ground I want to cover. And uh, so I'm going to do the best I can to make as much happen in this short amount of time. Um, the dirty dozen, and um, I'm not going to say I want you to write these down. And here's why. Because I'm not invested in whether you do or don't. I don't want you to, and I don't want you not to. I want you to do what you want to do. So if you want to grow and learn from these, then it would be a good idea to write them down. But I also know that a large percentage of product that people rush to buy at the back of a room when speakers are doing their thing, and they just absolutely have to have the material there's such a huge percentage of people that a year later, that material is still on the shelf, hence the term shelf help, right? Not self-help, but shelf help. And it's still got the shrink wrap on it. So we can decide to grow, expand, be, uh, and, and dreams are entirely haveable, but I think they are directly proportionate to our assessment of doability, if you will. Um, so here come these. Uh, and these, these are the biggest lies we've ever been told, and I have no doubt, and I only know a handful of you in here. I, I think I know four people in this whole room, and I will tell you that without knowing any of you, you have heard every one of these, and most of them have done damage to you. Here's the good news. That was then, this is now. Because today, on this day, we're actually going to undo the damage. Would you guys be, be up for that? Like undoing the damage that you might not even be aware of, of things you were told that were blatant lies? Let's try the first one. I'll believe it when I see it. We were taught that, which tells people that we're supposed to live without faith, right? So I'll believe it when I see it, when in fact the opposite is what's true, which is that we will see it when we believe it. It goes in that order. That is the pathway to manifestation. It is preceded by belief. So we can't stand around with our arms folded, crossed with the spirit of doubt, deciding that we will only believe things once we see them. First of all, for starters, that is as foolish as believing that there isn't a base to an iceberg just because you can't see it. When the truth is, the bigger portion of the iceberg is the part you can't see. I happen to hold that opinion about the entirety of life. I think that most of the magic that is going on in this world is stuff that occurs in the invisible realm. So the idea that you're going to wait around to see it in order to have faith in it, all I can say is if you subscribe to that theory, you are missing out on a whole bunch of magic 
in life. Uh, we need to get busy believing things first. That's how we will create them. Uh, number two, it's too good to be true. Anybody ever heard that? It's too good to be true. You know what no one ever said? No one ever said, gosh, that's just too bad to be true. It's so interesting. Nobody ever said that, which means we've learned to believe negativity like that. We will accept the worst story in the world and have no doubt that we are being told the truth when someone wants to pitch the awfulness of things. But the moment someone wants to pitch a really, really uplifting, powerful, enlightening, connected, wonderful story, there is such a tendency to say, well, you might, you might really want to inspect that because it, you know, it kind of sounds too good to be true. So what that would suggest is there is a level where goodness and true things can cohabitate with one another as long as it's down low. But the minute it starts getting lofty, now we move into fantasy. Again, if you'll look at my finger here, it's too good, it's too good up here to be true. So true things stay down low, right? Like low hopes. They're, they're way down here. And anything up here, we've now entered fantasy. It's too good to be true. So let's get it back down here in the town of Truthville. Uh, the fix to that is it's so good that it must be true. So there's your replacement phrase. It's so good that it must be true. I can't say this enough. Start looking forward to great things occurring and not necessarily down the road. How about today? How about in this session? How about tonight? How about again tomorrow morning? How about throughout the day tomorrow? How about get the self-imposed ceiling off of how much goodness your life can handle? That is how you'll attract limitless good. You know, it's, it's the way it works. Number three, don't get your hopes up. There's a fine piece of coaching. Thanks, mom and dad. Thanks, grandpa, grandma. Thank you, society. So let me just get this straight before I leave the door and head off to college. I just want to make sure I understand you correctly. Don't get your hopes up. Can you see a parent actually, and they're now counting down because their child's headed off to college. And they've only got like two minutes before they're going to walk out the front door and they go, gosh, baby, I've really enjoyed raising you. And by the way, we have kids ourselves. Our kids are grown. Our kids are 40 and 37 now. Uh, but, you know, imagine a parent, that child is getting ready to go out the door and they go, this is it. I mean, I'll be your parent your whole life, but I won't be raising you. I've got like a minute left of the experience of you being here under this roof and us being together and me tucking you in at night and, and reminding you of how much you're loved and so forth. But I, what can I give you to take out the door? What is it? 20 seconds left. You're headed out the door. Now 10, now nine, now eight, seven, six, five. Oh, I know what it is. Oh, I know. Uh, honey, remember this always. Don't get your hopes up. Imagine that as your parting words for your child headed out the door. You know what? Every great achiever in this lifetime, started with elevated hopes. That's what they all have in con common. None of them followed that instruction. None of them had low hopes. And in fact, their hopes were so friggin' high that they became expectations because that's what lives in the stratosphere, right? Expectations which were beyond hopes. And then at the highest level, those expectations mutated into inevitability. So it starts with hope, it graduates to expectation and then ultimately to inevitability. And if we see things as inevitable, it's not amazing that that perception of things serves as the very fertilizer from which manifestation shows up. Am I moving too fast or are you guys good? We're great. This is awesome. All right. So the next one, uh, you ever hear this one? I know the answer is yes, but sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. A bold face lie. Words are powerful. They are really powerful. And we want to watch, especially the ones we're responsible for, which are the ones that are rolling off of our own tongue and not only to other people and the things we say to them, but how about this? How about the words we're running toward ourselves? The things that we're saying to ourselves, asking ourselves to believe it. Words are huge. So watch and see if the script you're writing with your words is a script that a winner would write. And you can go from the end in mind. 
right? So go ahead and just perceive yourself to be the winner you are. We know that you are one. You outswam four to 500 million sperm to get here in the first place. That's how this whole dance started out. Every one of us were little tadpoles that were in a massive competition. And I say this at every seminar I've taught for 35 years, that life started in the winner's circle. The very first act that we were asked to perform, we were victorious against astounding odds, seemingly insurmountable odds. But you know what? Our spirit hadn't been exposed to the concept of doubt. All we knew was one word, and that word was yes. Just yes. You know, there are 500 million other competitors in today's race. Uh, I don't care. I don't care. I have swimming to do. I really don't care. And you went on to wiggle your little tail. I didn't make these numbers up. This is all science. 18,000 times in order to make that eight-inch journey up the fallopian tube. How many of you knew that Saturday's talk would include discussions of the fallopian tube? Um, so that's all true. You are a winner by divine design. You are anointed with that spirit. Anything else, doubt, loser syndrome, these are all learned behaviors. They are not part of your DNA. So I'm not here to teach you to win, and I'm, I'm going to make you an even bigger promise. You don't need to go to a big weekend to learn to win. You don't need to read a book to learn to win. You need to do one thing, one thing, and that's remember remember, remember, you're not going to learn it. It's in you. Remember that your nature is to win and every challenge you will face throughout the entire course of your life combined end on end. All of them put together will not exceed the original math of 500 million to one. So now by that remembrance, nothing by all rights should ever intimidate you. And I do mean nothing. And if it does intimidate you, go back to Remembranceville. Drive through the town of Remembranceville and get your stuff together and remember your nature is to win. Age is wisdom. Well, there's a real piece of garbage. First of all, that's not true. And I decided that's true, not true years ago. And my main reason is because I've met a tremendous number of elderly idiots. Age is not wisdom. Age is liver spots, wrinkles, and ultimately death. That's what age is. Paying attention equals wisdom. Paying attention. And this is where we get the expression, she is an old soul, or he is an old soul. Just getting older and that alone does not make you wiser unless you're paying attention. So age plus paying attention I will give the world that, that that does indeed make us wiser. But age and age alone has never made anyone wiser, especially the people who duck their heads in the sand or they anesthetize themselves and avoid the triumphs that are available to us in this lifetime. If you live your entire life intoxicated and missing out on the lessons that are available to you, you won't be a day wiser than you were when your dependency began. This is something that is not even my opinion. This has been medically proven. And yes, booze killed my brother this year. I had one sibling only, and he's gone at age 62 because of alcohol. Because alcohol became a career choice. And it is very hard to take that a vibrant being who, if he had been able to remember who it is he was, and was designed to be an entirely different script could have been written. But it wasn't because life is a choice, consequence, cause, and effect situation. For every choice we make, there's a consequence. For every cause, there's an effect. And we get to decide whether or not we're going to play the role of victim or whether or not we're going to choose in alignment with what is available to us in this lifetime. Unfortunately, he was fed a bag full of negativity. We both were. We both were. And so it's up to the individual to find ways to offset whatever misinstruction or lack of love or brutality or punishment or rage or beatings, all of which were part of our life. And when I was 14, I decided to do something about it by inviting in a healing 
to just breathe and remember most everything that is going on here is nonsense. And I'm a couple of years away from leaving and moving out into the world. And I get to shake my mental etch a sketch of all the stuff that I don't like and that I don't believe in. And I get to draw something new. Um, so the next one, number seven, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. You remember that? You don't know what you've got till it's gone. Pay paradise and put up a parking lot. You guys remember that song? So I don't think we have to lose something to be in touch with its value. Here's the cool thing. We have this often unused gift. It's a gift from God called the imagination. And when we take our imagination, we can go anywhere. So I invite you today in this moment, if you want, to go ahead and mentally lose something. Like right now, what if I lost my spinal cord and I wouldn't even be able to do this? Just that little act of getting up out of my chair. What would it be like if I couldn't, when this is over, get up out of my chair and leave my office upstairs and navigate the stairs going down? Or what if right now there, my eyes are closed. What if there was no such thing as ever reopening them? What if some of the key people in my life, like Jim Gardner, what if Jim Gardner weren't here? What if we, he weren't here in my life? And Ken Walls, I believe, might be here today. And what if Ken were not in my life? These are people that I have wonderful friendships with. What if I didn't have my wife of 43 years we've been together? Married for 41, but we've been together for 43. And by the way, my wife and I met when I was seven and she was six and we lived two doors down from one another. And yes, we played this fabulous game together called Doctor. How many of you know the game Doctor? A couple of you are raising your hands. For those of you who don't know the game, it's called I'll Show You Mine If You Show Me Yours. And we played it as often as we could as little children. And it was non-sexual and it was quite playful and it was fun and it was harmless. And then I didn't see her for nine years because we moved away to the north side of town. And I got a whisper on November the 8th, 1976, out of the blue, call Carolyn. And it wasn't like, your attention, please, all Kmart shoppers. It wasn't that. It wasn't a voice that was audible, but it was an understanding from within, call Carolyn. The thing is, I don't question my whispers. My whispers are my internal guidance system, and I obey them. And I do not require that they be convenient, and I do not require that they make sense. If you write those down, that alone will change your life. Listen and obey your whispers. Do not require that they make sense. A lot of them come in in a nonlinear way, but they are there and have one thing only, I promise you this is the truth. Your safety, your protection, and help. It's just help. They're there to help. They're there to make your life better. Right? So whispers are so key. And that whisper said, call Carolyn. I didn't challenge it. I went to this thing you may remember from your past called a phone book. And I looked up the name. I remembered her dad's name. Hadn't seen her in nine years. And there they were. Same name, one street over. Got to be the same guy called immediately. I'm talking two minutes after the whisper, the phone is ringing. That's taking action. And Carolyn answered. I didn't know it was her. I just heard a female answer. And uh, she said, hello. And I said, yes, is uh, Carolyn there? She said, this is Carolyn. Who is this? And I said, well, uh, before I tell you, we, we've not spoken in many years. I I'll give you a hint. I have red hair. And she goes, Glenn? And I said, yeah, it's me. She says, who told you? I said, who told me what? She goes, no, no, really, don't, don't mess with me because I'm getting chicken skin right now. Who told you that I've been looking for you? And it turns out that two short weeks before my call, she had been trying to track me down. Now, this is nine years apart. And within two weeks, both of us were trying to reach the other unbeknownst to the other, which is evidence that we had an appointment to keep. We had an appointment to keep called spending the rest of our lives together. And she said, are you calling from California? And I said, no, because in those years, you know, we didn't have cell phones. There was no such, a th such thing as a call display. 
she said, are you calling from California? And I said, no, why, why would you ask that? She goes, because I read an article about you in the Dallas Morning News that said you had done very well in the movies and, and that things were going well. I just assumed when you left the neighborhood, you went to Los Angeles. I said, no, but I am going to California and I'm moving out there in just a few months. Again, this at the time I was 17 and was wrapping up high school. So I said, no, I'm right here. And she said, well, you know, we should get together sometime. And this is priceless. I said, the smartest thing I've ever said in my life. And I said, the earliest I could do that would be immediately. And I went out and got my 1974 Cherry Red Vega. Gentlemen, let me give you a little hint. If a woman will date your butt, excuse me, if she will date your butt while you're driving a Vega, that's the real deal. That's a keeper. So uh, I went over to her house and we started dating that night. That was November the 8th of 1976. So we are sitting here at 43 years and change. Let me jump back into number eight is time heals all wounds. Really? Time heals all wounds. Really? Have you ever been to a family reunion? Yeah. Yeah. That didn't really go that way so much. You've got people at the reunion that are still hating Uncle Ted for what he did 35 years ago, right? So time does not heal all wounds. You know what does? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Good old-fashioned concept. Forgiveness heals wounds. Time does not. Time plus forgiveness will heal. But time minus forgiveness, that's why resentment can be harbored for years and resentment destroys lives. Well, you know, I was told that time would heal this wound, so I'm, I'm going to leave it up to time. I'm going to just sit back and do nothing with my life, but I'm going to wait on time to heal this for me. It's nonsense. It is the opposite of being proactive in a matter. So don't look for time to fix it for you. Be more involved than that. Get in the thick of things and let go of your resentments. They will kill you. Let go of resentments. They're one of the worst things you can hang on to in your life. Number nine, well, the boy's too big for his britches. He's just too big for his britches. And what that really would imply is that society only made one pair of britches, and your job as a member of the human race is to wear them, right? You're going to wear your society-issued britches, and don't you dare outgrow them. You know why? Because if you do, you're going to threaten the herd. You're going to threaten the herd with your bigness. You know what? You got to be willing to outgrow your britches. And I want to encourage everybody here. It says you think he skipped it. What did I skip? What did I skip? Somebody talk to me. Hey, Glenn, this is Andrew. Apparently, you skipped over what they're calling number six. I wasn't numbering mine. Oh, age is wisdom was number six. Age is wisdom. Yeah, maybe they have it misnumbered. But that's okay. okay. And maybe you can go over all 12. And, and number seven is you don't know what you've got till it's gone. Number eight is time heals all wounds. Number nine is too big for your britches. So I just want to encourage you all to outgrow your britches and Amen. don't let any fear concerning your britch size or it threatening. Look, part of success includes being met with resistance. It's not a negative attitude. It's just the way it is. In fact, it's almost a universal litmus test to find out how devoted to success you are. If you're really devoted, you're going to be met with walls of resistance. And it just says, hey, baby, what are you made of? And how badly do you want this thing? How badly do you want it? Because you'll find a way to go up, around, under, over, or through whatever the resistance is. And it'll all be proportionate to how badly you want it. Here's another one. Real men don't cry. Man, that has done a lot of damage. Real men don't cry. You know what this strongly implies? In fact, it blatantly implies that the creator accidentally installed tear ducts in men. Oops, my bad. Sorry. I know you call me God, but I kind of blew that one. Yeah, that was an oversight. I had been drinking that day, and I accidentally on the assembly line left over what I had only intended to place in women. That's insanity. We need to work with what the design was. We are supposed to cry. We are supposed to feel. We are supposed to emote. And the last thing we should be doing, forgive me for shooting on your butts, is thrusting a tissue to someone the minute they start crying. Here, have a tissue. 
here, have, have, have a tissue. Your tears are making me uncomfortable. I, I don't think I can deal with this. Have a, have a tissue. Please make it stop. When the truth is what that person needs more than anything in the world is to just feel. They need to feel and they need to let it out. When you are constantly mopping up your tears or somebody else's every time you start to feel things and you shut it off, that is as foolish as handing someone a cork when you see that they've got diarrhea. Imagine if someone had diarrhea and you went, hey, don't do that. Put this cork up your butt and stop that nonsense. Nobody would do that. Nobody would hand somebody a cork and say, quit pooping. It's wrong. Hang on to that ugly poop. You need, to, you need to keep that inside of you. What are you doing? It's the same thing. And while you may be laughing, it happens to be spot on accurate. So for the record, real men do cry. Let me take it a step further and say healthy men cry. And shame on those people. Shame on them who taught us we don't cry because they did our emotional universe a huge disservice. The next one. Money doesn't grow on trees. What a great way to teach young people that money is hard to come by, and you wonder why people have financial struggles. All they can hear in their head is, you know, money doesn't grow on trees, son. It just doesn't grow on trees. It's not that available. You gotta, I want you to remember that your whole life, that it's just not that available. And then they struggle monetarily, and it's really because we had some terrible downloading. So money is as available as you decide. Life is going to follow our opinions. And the last one, man, I've never done these so fast. The last one is the grass is always greener on the other side. Anyone want to guess what the most damaging phrase out of that is? The single word, rather. The most damaging word in the grass is always greener on the other side. It's the word always. Always. Not it's sometimes greener on the other side, or it's greener in the spring. The grass is always greener on the other side, or so it seems, right? So that was the teaching, or so it seems. And so if we really believe that, what's going to happen is we're always going to be chasing down green grass, right? We're going to be looking for it somewhere else. Why? Because it's always on the other side, not some of the time, all of the time. And that keeps us always looking out for it. Oh, where's the green grass? Where is it? Because I, I damn sure know it's not here. So I, I know it's somewhere else. So I'm going to get really, really busy finding the green grass. And then when we find it, we can't wait to tell our buddies about it. That we, I found it, man. I'm taking off my shoes. I'm standing in it. I'm in the green grass. And then, you know, within 90 days, that lawn, that green grass that we found is the exact same color as the lawn we left 90 days ago. And the reason is because the grass has no opinion about its own color. It's simply responding to the skills of its landscaper. And that's you. And that's me. So whatever was doing what it was doing to the grass at home, when we take those lawn care skills somewhere else, it just does it to the grass there. And this is why it's so pointless for people who hop from one relationship to the next, always changing the scenery and thinking that's what's going to fix it. And now you've got three marriages, four, now five, now six, or God knows how many partners because your pattern is to just keep changing the scenery instead of addressing matters at home. Number five, number five was sticks and stones may break my bones. Someone asked what number five was. So let me go back over them real quickly and then I'll move on to the next thing. So one was I'll believe it when I see it. Number two is it's too good to be true. Number three, don't get your hopes up. Number four, nice guy. Oh, oh, I did skip one. Aha, I just caught it. Number four, sorry. And it doesn't matter what order. There's no certain order. Uh, I, I did skip over one, which is nice guys finish last. Nice guys finish last. Again, what terrible life instruction. Because basically what it says is it says, if you're nice, don't count on finishing first. Because nice guys finish last. So make up your mind, dude. Is it going to be nice or is it going to be first? Because it damn sure can't be both. It's a huge lie. I've worked with the best people in the entertainment industry. The, the top dogs, I've worked with most of them, as you will do in a 45-year career. And what they all had in common, the biggies, not the, not the wannabes, not the people who are under the misguided impression that their poop doesn't stink. I'm talking about the people at the top of the game 
what they all have in common is they are nice. They're really, really, really cool people. And that's how they got to be where they are. Okay. So uh, that's number four. Nice guys finish last five is sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Number six, age is wisdom. Number seven, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. Number eight, time heals all wounds. Number nine, too big for your britches. Number 10, real men don't cry. Number 11, money doesn't grow on trees. And number 12, the grass is always greener on the other side. And you know, it wouldn't be me if I didn't give you a bonus. So the bonus one with the number 13, I'm going to just make one up because it's one I'm so tired of hearing in this world. And it's when people say, well, you know, it's easier said than done. It's one of the biggest cop-outs ever. You know, it's easier said than done. It's a great way to take no responsibility for creating results in your life. Just make sure that everyone is clear that it's a whole lot easier to talk about it. Well, let me ask you guys this. What if you simply don't co-sign that belief? What if you just don't agree with that? What if you agree that, yes, it is a baker's dozen, Ken? Uh, what if you agree that it is just as easy to have it as it is to talk about it? What if you hold that belief that there is no differentiation? Say it, have it, speak it, manifest it, and you don't see that as something that is difficult. I'll promise you, for you, it won't be. But for everyone who says, well, it's easier said than done, they are the ones responsible for having installed the struggle modality. Does that make sense? Right? So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And all of my life coaching, all of it is on what the mind is creating, right? By its chronic opinionitis. So it's not even the events that we've been shaped by. Because we've all been through garbage. We've been through a lot of beauty. But I have no question. I'm looking around. I see a bunch of adults. And, and you've been on the planet a while. You've been through some things. And you've survived 100% of them. You're still here. So you're batting 1,000, which is a pretty impressive average, having survived it all. Um, so I want to move on real quickly to a thing called the four rooms. These are rooms of consciousness. Did you guys enjoy those? I mean, it's painful to realize, but did, did it help to take a look at maybe why there's some inherent struggle going on with life? Oh, I love the heart. Thank you for that. Yes. Sophia, yeah. I really love that heart. Thank you, sweetie. It's really uh, powerful, Glenn. This is great stuff. Great yeah. feedback from everyone. Thanks, Kyle. And I'm, I forgive my speed when I'm coaching. I teach in my workshops all day in Dallas on Mondays and Tuesdays. I teach from 1130 in the morning till midnight. And I love it. I love it. I get to do it. I don't have to do it. It's the love of my life. And uh, now that, you know, now that we're doing it online, I used to have a studio here in Dallas, but with the virus, it moved me into the Zoom format, and now we know no zip code, so I'm having people from all over the world join in, which is great. I really owe a heartfelt thank you to Ken Walls, uh, my buddy who's in the room today, because Ken was the one who helped me understand how to teach in the Zoom format and, and learning about online teaching, because I, I, I tend to not be thinking along the uh, technical lines, and I have people that help me with that aspect of it. So this real quickly is on the four rooms of consciousness. and um, these are mindsets that will determine, and you'll see where you fall into these. Uh, these did not come from a sermon. I didn't get them from a book. These were more of God's whispers that I have paid attention to. And the thing is, I always carry a pen. I always carry a pen. So I'm always writing things down when I feel them. Um, and so this was an awareness that wanted to reveal itself through me many, many years ago about the mindset with which we interpret the events of our lives. So room one is the room of impossibility. Just, just write, if you would, the word impossibility. They see things as impossible. They see things as far-fetched. Their theme word is no. And I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about that room because I don't want you in that room because that room will bring you no gifts. It is a really, really rugged place to hang out. And these are the people who, whenever you run an idea by them, they go, no. You go, well, I was just wondering if, no. Well, you know, I could always do that business down in Cincinnati. No. You know, I was thinking about marrying Charlene. No. Well, what if we were to get that new German Shepherd? No. You know, we could invest in real estate. No. What about that new theater? No. We could buy a plane. No. And so their no's are locked and loaded. They're there in advance. They're not even listening to you. They have a pre-loaded no response. Be careful, because if you get in bed with these people, and I'm not talking about sexual 
bed. I'm talking about going into business, going into partnership, any kind of partnership with a room one personality, that relationship is doomed. The business will fail and not maybe, not maybe, because it is a powerful contaminant. Room two is possibility, possibility. Their theme word is maybe. This is a beautiful thing, guys. It's a beautiful thing, right? Possibility, maybe. What someone who lives in room two is essentially saying when you share with them is they're saying, okay, I'm listening. I'm listening. Talk to me. Tell me more. I'm listening. Maybe that's true. Maybe it isn't. They are, either, they are neither pro nor con. They are neither yes nor no. They're neither leaning forward nor backward. They are standing perfectly still in a full upright position saying, tell me more. I'm listening. That's room two. Possibility theme word is maybe. Room three. Now you've got impossibility and possibility. Room three is probability. Their theme word is likely. They don't see things as no, and they don't even see things as maybe they see it as likely. In other words, this is probably going to occur. We've got this plan in motion, and I think this is the probable outcome. And there is one realm beyond that. And this is the realm I want to invite you to spend the bulk of your time in, if not all of it. And that's room for inevitability. Their theme word is the polar opposite of room one. Their theme word is yes. It's the only thing they stand for. Yes, yes, yes. And they so, they so confidently and habitually use the word yes is they will say yes before you've even asked the question. If Jim Gardner calls me up and says, Glenn, I was wondering, yes, Jim, now what did I just say yes to? Talk to me. That's confidence. That's relationship capital. That's the spirit that I moved to California with. So help me God. That is the spirit that allows you to say, I am not going to pursue a career. I'm going to have one. Yes, yes, and yes. Simply yes. And the way you can have that consciousness is by pulling all of the other play book pages out of the playbook. So maybe, gone. No, gone, out of the playbook. It's not there. It's not even there as an option. Sorry, guys, can't run that play. It's not in there. I'm not about maybe. And I want to also add this. This is not fake passion. I didn't jack myself up for this meeting. This is how I actually live my life. This is how I feel it. This is the energy that I run. This is why I don't have a drug or alcohol problem. I've never needed it. And I'm not bragging. I'm saying that there is basically we get to decide how alive we want to be in this lifetime. And only our thoughts or buying into someone else's are what stop it. That's all it's up to is what self-imposed governor is going to be there. And, and why are we trying to be less? My description of humankind is magnificent creatures that are unrepeatable miracles behaving as if they're not. That's how I describe the whole human race. People who are not tapping into the fullness of their potentiality and the worst thing ever, they wind up getting put in a box before their music was played. And that's deeply upsetting to me. So again, four rooms of consciousness or mindsets, impossibility, theme word, no, possibility, theme word, maybe, probability, theme word, theme word likely, and inevitability, simply yes, so, for example, I didn't hope, I didn't wish, and I didn't want today to go well. I understood that it would. And if that seems cocky, so be it. So be it. It wouldn't occur to me that it would go any other way. And that's how I've been speaking for 35 years. When someone says, we'd like to have you on our stage, I already know in advance that it is going to go well and that it going well is an inevitability. And it's interesting that that knowledge is the very thing that fuels it going well. Well, it's easier said than done. And now we're back on that damn hamster wheel again, right? As soon as someone greets it with that's easier said than done. Uh, how many of you know who Peter Coyote is? 
a great character actor. I've worked with him and uh, Peter and I did a big movie over in Bulgaria many years ago. I've made 251 films and television shows. They've got me credited on IMDb as something like 240. And one of my favorite people in all of those years to work with was Peter Coyote. Peter shared this with me at breakfast one morning and I never forgot it. We were having a profound spiritual discussion. And he said, Glenn, you know, I've always held the belief that we all come from the same river, all of us, all over the world. And that river was flowing through the cosmos. And at the moment of our birth, that river shot out over a water waterfall and changed the river into spray, a bunch of droplets. And as they are falling, that period is called our lifetime. We are still river disguised as droplets. And as we look over at the fellow falling particles in midair, those people are just as much river as you are. And there is only connection. There is only oneness because we're the same thing. And we shall be reunited in the river below. I've never heard anyone describe life more beautifully than that in my 61 years. To realize that separation is an illusion. And we are responsible for that illusion we are responsible for continuing that illusion or we can practice oneness and live accordingly in this lifetime. Thank you, Peter Coyote. I am actually almost done with today's talk. I got a couple more things. Do I have uh, a little bit longer, Kyle, or do you need me to just shush? No, uh, go as long as you want, Glenn. This is am amazing. And if okay. you have time for questions, oh, after, you know that I do, would be baby. great. Okay, you, you awesome. Know I do. Uh, I'm going. here to make myself available. So God bless Thank Peter Coyote. God That's bless beautiful. him. Yeah, totally for beautiful. Sure. Um, you know, and it's interesting, I'm, I'm, I may, I may offend someone when I say this, but I'm absolutely okay with doing so. I seek not to offend, but I want to, I want to say something that's very eye opening. You guys remember this song that we heard when we were kids and it goes something like this. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Here's what it didn't say. He's got the United States in his hands. He's got the United States. It's the whole world. It's the whole world. And I don't know why we've gotten away from that. And I think that we are going to remain problemed as long as we separate from one another. And as soon as we look at every nation and every person as a fellow droplet of the river, that's, that's when we will be united. And that's when we will know peace. And that's when the entire world will return to its glory. That's just something I wanted to say today. Get to know your death day self. Get to know your death day self using God's underused gift of imagination. Talk to yourself on the last day of your life. I've been teaching this for many, many years. Get to know him or her and do it out loud. Don't just run the thought. It'll always be more powerful when you speak it. So actually just, just say, I realize, because here's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you peek in. I'm, gonna, I'm, in. I'm actually going to be bold enough to act on your behalf I'm going to now become your death day self talking to you because here is what he or she is saying. They are saying, I need you. I need you. Oh, young version of me. I need you because they've just told me I'm leaving the world in a couple of minutes. So I can't do anything about reframing my resume. I can't do it. I'm running out of time. In fact, now they're telling me it's a minute and a half before I'm leaving. So here's what I need from you, young one. I need you to equip me with a level of readiness that has me exiting this experience on this planet with a smile on my face, looking back at the entire thing saying, that is exactly the life I came to live. That's it. That's what I had in mind and be proud of that life. I have been talking with my death day self and he has been advising me beautifully by just saying, we think about this one. We think about this one. 
Is this one you want on your resume? Is this one you want? Is this better? Does this go on to become a regret for you? Because I care about you. I'm not interested in saddling up, saddling you up with even one more regret. One of the affirmations we have weekly in my program is, is uh, no more regrets. Because I understand you have regrets. I'm talking about living a life where you're not looking to add more to the pile. Because regrets become very heavy over time. And I do believe we are all capable of living in that no more regret bandwidth, if you will. Your death day self will change your life. Again, though, do it out loud and just say, what would you like from me now? Because the only thing I can do about my past is reframe my opinion about it. But it's still in the history books as is. I can, I can convert my thinking to a healthier mindset, but I, I can be very much involved with everything beginning in this moment and moving forward. What would you like? And I will promise you, they will help you make decisions. That brings me to this next one, which is the most effective way to make big decisions in your life. And it's a four tiered step and it's very, very simple, but it's not for kids. This is for adult thinkers. This is for people who really want to grow up and live large and have big, big things. And, and to me, you know what the greatest thing we're after in, in my view, having, having talked with so many people about their lives and what they've achieved or what they own or how much money, it, it ain't about money. It ain't about money. I think the trophy in this lifetime is a sense of personal peace. I think that's the trophy. When you are celebrating the experience of residing in your uniquely assigned sack of skin, I don't think there's a greater thing available to a human being than to say, I love who I am. I love where I am. I don't wish to be anyone else. I don't want what someone else has. I don't want their house. I don't want their car. I don't want younger body. I don't, I don't want anything to be other than what it is. And if I have a difference of opinion, I know that it's my job to change it. And I'm not going to wish a change into existence. I'm going to do whatever it takes to affect a change. But I don't want someone else's bank account. I don't, want, I don't want their career. I don't want their title. I don't even want to be like them. I want to be like me. When unfolding in the highest and most beautiful way. And I think when we quit idolizing other people and instead choose to idolize the within and look and go, you know what? I've sure been spending a lot of time thinking about everybody else and what they're doing or not doing. What if I just check in with me and decide to go ahead and say, yes, let's take this into room four. Yes. So talk to your death day self, ask it, ask it what it would like. Is there something you would like me to discontinue? Is there something you'd like me to begin for you now? Since you won't be able to get, now you're down to 15 seconds left before you're going to leave the world. You can't start a new career. What would you like me to do for you? What can I gift you with? I love you. I love us. I want to say that again. I love you. I love us. I'm here to help. I think we have to be devoted. I think we have to be dedicated. And I think the more that we're dedicated, the less we're medicated. The more we're dedicated, the less we're medicated. I think dedication will do the world for us. Uh, wow, I'm at the tail end of the things that I, I wanted to talk about today. There's so much more. Um, I do believe that our opinions keep us stuck. So it's not even the events. It's our opinions about the events. So just make sure when you're going through events in time that have occurred that you've chosen to feel wounded by, see if you can come up with a reframing of that. Because I actually hold that this is true. I think that every single person we meet in our lifetimes is there to help us. Now, before you jump to conclusions and say, Glenn, you're full of it, let me clarify. They may not intend that. And I know that many of them don't. What I'm saying is that everyone you've ever crossed paths with is there to help you, and here's how I can prove it. They are only going to be doing one of two things. Everyone you ever meet is going to do one of two things. They're either going to behave in a way you admire. Are you with me? They're going to behave in a way you admire. And you're going to look and go, that's beautiful. She's so loving. Man, that's, that's incredible. Look at that smile. Look at that energy. Look at that, 
Look at that kindness. Look at that compassion. Look at that passion. Look at that connectedness. And it goes on and on and on. So now we see someone who has been an excellent role model of exactly who and how to be. That's category one. The only other category is category two, and those are the people who model for us exactly who and what not to be. And what's interesting, upon further review, it turns out they've helped us every bit as much. So we can convert those people who we used to see as our enemies or the people that we've held resentments toward because of the damage they caused us and instead turn around and energetically send them a thank you and say, hey, you know what? Thank you for showing me exactly how not to live my life. By being on the receiving end of your bullshit, forgive me, but I'm going to call it what it is. I've been on the receiving end of your bullshit. And because of it, I will never put someone on the receiving end of that stuff coming out of me ever. And this is how we chose to raise our children. I never, ever hit either one of my kids because I was hit all the time and the vast majority for no reason whatsoever than a rageaholic stepfather. No other reason. His issues, not mine. Things that were not wrong. And I've never changed my opinion about that my whole life. As an adult, I look back and go, you were right. You were right. You were eight years old and you knew the truth. You knew the truth. Someone else had a problem, but they were bigger than you and they were given say so. So remember those things. Remember the people who did things or said things or caused you pain. Remember that. Bless them for showing you how not to live life. Here's what not to do. Here's how not to talk to someone. Here's how not to behave. Don't do this. And they weren't trying to teach you that way. They were just doing what they were doing. And most of it was done mindlessly. But it turns out that we can use everything that occurred to our benefit by reframing it and seeing all of it as guidance, not some of it. I think it's a mistake to take out a few sound bites from your life and go, well, that's the good stuff and that's what helped me most. That's what made me who I am. It all made you who you are, all of it. But use it and don't bitch about it, right? Bitching about it is the problem. That's the problem. And in doing so, you've empowered um, the people who caused you harm because you're queuing it all up again, right? So even though the abuse stopped maybe 30, 40 years ago, it starts up every time we queue it up and we choose to associate it with pain and ugliness. And we say it was so unfair and I'm really a victim. And instead just go, you know what? I so appreciate you removing that from my playbook by showing me that that's an awful way to live life. So I don't need to do that. Thank you very much. Eminently helpful. We tend to remember things that are associated with pain. Okay, uh, I've got one last one, and that's these five words. Um, you can write them down. They are not mine, and these didn't come from a whisper. They came from a very wise man by the name of Russell Friedman, who changed my life in 1993 when I attended a place in Los Angeles called the Grief Recovery Institute. And I was in there to let go of some things that had remained ungrieved because I was not allowed to grieve growing up. That's a true story. I was not allowed to grieve. I had my father taken away from me, and I was told to take it and not say a word. I wasn't allowed to mention my dad's name. I wasn't allowed to call him dad, or I was beaten for that. I don't tell you this to, to create sympathy. I don't need any sympathy. I'm good to go. I'm, I'm in love with life. I didn't like it at the time, but it taught me who not to be. So I had some grieving to do and some tears to shed. How many of you guys, I can't ask the ladies, but how many of you guys were ever told this one? When, when you were beaten, for some of you who were maybe beaten, your father followed it up by saying, I'll give you something to cry about. Like that was the follow-up to the beating. So I'm seeing some hands go up so you can relate. So now it's doubly bad because you're being beaten for something that you didn't do so you don't deserve it. And then you're being told that if you react to the beating, then they're going to beat you harder, right? So this is such a bad message because they're doing what they shouldn't be doing in the first place. And then their follow-up is to beat you if you react like the normal emotional human being that you are. And we wonder why emotions, you know, get all out of whack. 
So I'm going to close today by saying something that will change your life. And hopefully several of these other things have helped you immeasurably. But this one will be worth the price of admission. Here are the five words. That's old. I'm new. Goodbye. And here's how you will use that. You're going to look over at a thing that you've done, excuse me, possibly for many years. Maybe it's a way of thinking. Maybe it's toxic thinking. Maybe it's a self-destructive physical habit that you've been damaging a particular body, part of your body, just showing it no respect whatsoever and not, not remembering that this is a temple and it is the temporary vessel through which we express, and it's the only one we will be issued in this lifetime. Therefore, taking care of it makes tremendous sense. If you were only going to drive one car your whole life, don't you think you would have its oil checked and have the brakes? I mean, you would be on top of its maintenance if the rules were you don't get to buy another car in this lifetime. This one car, that's it. So I know that no one would ever knowingly put a hose in their gas tank and turn on the water, and yet we would do the metaphorical equivalent to our own bodies all the time. So I would invite you to at least treat your body as well as you do your own car. And in truth, I would invite you to treat it even better. So whatever you're doing that is admittedly self-destructive, whatever you're about to do, identify it before you're about to reach for that habit again and say these words, that's old. And look right over at it. This is how we were trained. We were trained to look and go, that's old. And then step forward and step away from it. So step one step away from that which is old and say the next two words, I'm new. I'm new. And then turn back to it and say goodbye. So again, those five words are, that's old. I'm new. Goodbye. You can release anything in your life that you're ready to be done with, and you're probably not going to get rid of anything that you're tired of. You're only going to release it when you're done. So you have to tell it, that's old. I'm new, which is the remembrance that you're new as of this moment, in this new day, that you're a brand new creature. And let this new day give you its gift of newness. And then look back at the old habit that you're ready to have no longer be in your life and tell it goodbye. What Russell told us is that it will continue to creep up from time to time. But you keep saying, that's old, I'm new, goodbye. And after a while, he says, it will go away. And I have seen it be flawless in people's lives for many, many years. Kyle, that's what I've got, brother. Glenn, this has been amazing. Let's give everyone unmute yourself and let's give them a big hand. Then we're going to do Q&A. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Hey. So much. Glenn. You're welcome. You know what I want to do right now? First breath of the last hour and change. (laughs) I'm happy to handle some questions. I mean, Glenn brought a whole spiritual, philosophical life experience, but don't be afraid to ask him a, a Hollywood question. You can ask him anything you want. I think he'll fill any type of question, but whatever you think's important, um, feel free. And I have some for Glenn as well. So if, if you don't have any, I can cover it. Glenn, you're actually muted somehow. There we go. Okay. I just said, you go ahead and call on the people for me. Okay. So I got, uh, got Jeffrey and guys, go ahead and just raise your hand in the chat and then we'll call on you. So Jeffrey Miller. Cool. Go, can you go hear ahead. me? Now we Brother can. Glenn, how are you? Hey, great buddy. To, nice. Great to see you. Great to see you. Same. Uh, yeah, I tell you what, uh, you know, after meeting you in person eight years ago when you met my lovely wife, Emily, and you said, I have a daughter, Emily. I'm never going to forget you. Well, she's never forgotten you either, brother. <laughs> uh, and she still has that picture of the three of us. She just loves that. Mm. She says to say hello, by the way. But this is it. You got me, and you know my story. You know where I'm yes. going, what I'm, I'm yes. going through. And I love you, by the way. I love you. Thank you, brother. Um, you have been so supportive. I could cry my eyes out, and big boys do cry, and they should cry. And thank you for that. You, you bet. emphasize that. 
you said talk to, oh, I'm going to flip the page here. Talk to your death self. Your death, day, your death day self. Um, in July 2017, I had to learn to do that, but I didn't, I didn't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. I had to go to that because they told me I had six months to a year to live, and I was gone. The ticket had been punched. The conductor said, boy, you're off this train. You're out of here. And, right. you know, being a, being a boy from Boston, I, I don't like that. You know, uh, uh, I, I got, I just love everything that you share. I love everything. And, you know, I love the show with Ken. I, you know, you guys are amazing. I, I love it because you exude integrity, honesty, and above all that word, those four letters that you say all the time, I'm going to reach through and give you a big hug right now. I love you. You say love. And I do love you, brother. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, Jeffrey. And, and I, I do love, I love powerfully. And I think that I am an acquired taste. I, I don't think I'm for everybody. And the reason is because daddy ain't playing. I mean, I love to play. I love to joke around. I didn't even get to, um, I, it would be remiss of me if I didn't tell you that if you ever want to get rid of nerves, guys, if you've ever been on a job interview and you got nervous about it and, you just didn't feel like you were at your best. Um, I'm going to cut straight to my biggest secret and not even give you the long-winded story behind it, but I left this off of my presentation today, and it would not be fair if I didn't mention that years ago, I booked my first television series, series regular, where it's a running role in the show, by responding to a whisper. And I was headed out my front door, and I got a whisper. It was a comedy for ABC, and I got this whisper. And I went back in the house and Carolyn greeted me and said, did you forget something? She thought maybe I just left my keys or whatever. And I said, no, I just, just heard a whisper. She said, what'd you hear? And I said, well, you know, this thing I'm reading for today is a sitcom and I need to be funny. And something has just told me that I need to go to ABC today with my shoes filled with syrup. And that's exactly what we did. We went into the kitchen and we put Aunt Jemima and Log Cabin both, one in each shoe, and I went to ABC with my, and I'm not talking about a couple of drops. I'm talking about plenty where my feet were swimming in syrup. I am a grown man. And I walked into that room and I have never felt a more profound sense of ease slash mischief. And then I watched as the waft hit them, their noses. And they were going like, and looking at each other, wondering, what, why do I suddenly have the urge to dine at the International House of Pancakes? And I wound up booking the role. On the next job, I took little baby marshmallows, the miniature ones, and put them between my toes and booked that role. The third one, I put miniature uh, marshmallows, I put syrup, and put Canadian bacon in my socks. I am not joking, by the way. This is all to de-emphasize the heaviness of the experience. And the record at the agency at that time was four jobs in a row. One right after the other where the actor went in, read, booked, read, booked, read, booked, read, booked. And now I have tied the record. And they have gotten uh, a meeting for me that is tomorrow afternoon. And if I book this job, that'll be five in a row. And that'll give me the, the record for the agency. Standing year, I think it was 30 years standing record. And here's what went off in my mind. I thought, wow, if it works this well in my shoes, where else might I want to begin placing things? And on job number five, I went to the grocery store and bought Oscar Mayer bologna. I pulled out a slice, folded it in half, and wedged it directly between my butt cheeks. And I went in and booked the series. Job number six, baloney between the butt cheeks, booked it. I booked seven, eight, and nine, a record that has been standing for over 25 years, nine in a row. And I'm convinced the only reason I didn't book the 10th one is because I ran out of friggin' baloney. But it is the truth. I booked the series 24 with baloney in my butt cheeks. And these are things you're not going to hear at a traditional business seminar, but so many people suffer from uh, sweaty palms, a nervous voice, 
uh, whatever. But nervousness is very common and people are not relaxed to create. I'm telling you, shove some food products in your undershorts. You will say, Kyle, where did you find this guy? I was questioning his sanity. Do you know that CEOs have been writing me for years saying, dude, I thought you were nuts. Here's what one of them said. One of them was also an actor. And he said, I have been on 90 auditions since I got to LA and I am zero for 90. And I said, well, then someone had told him to come to my audition mastery course. And they knew that he would love the food and the undershorts things. He said, I'm, I'm going to try it. Well, he did. And I gave him my phone number. I said, I want you to tell me about the results and how empowered you felt. So he calls me a few days later and he was quivering his voice and I knew it was going to be good news. And he said, hey, Glenn, I've got to tell you, I did the food in the undershorts thing. And I just got my very first call back. And I am elated and I can't thank you enough. I've been in LA five years, never gotten a call back, never gotten a call back. And I got a call back. I said, great. When is the call back? He said, the call back was this morning. And buddy, I just got off the phone and I got my very first job. Now, mind you, I have studied Shakespearean technique, uh, transcendental meditation. I know all about the Meisner method. I know everything. I've taken every friggin' class under the sun. And you tell me to put food products in my undershorts and it worked. I said, well, don't leave me hanging. What did you do? And he goes, well, you promise you won't judge me. And I thought, oh, this is going to be good. <laughs> this is going to be good. And he said, Glenn, I'm a grown man. And yet I will admit to you that I took an entire handful of Kellogg's Frosted Flakes and put them like you did between my butt cheeks. And he goes, have, have you ever done that? I said, no, I, I somehow missed the memo on that one. <laughs> but uh, he said, well, what do, you, what do you think of that? Do you think that's crazy? I said, crazy, are you kidding me? Kellogg's Frosted Flakes, I think that's great. So anyway, uh, let me answer a couple more questions. No more, no more stuff like that. But that is, that's a great takeaway, is learn to play more. Some of you are too sophisticated for your own good. You need to play more. Go back and be like a kid, have some fun. And Glenn, I can say 100%, you said you're acquired taste, 100% everyone on this call loved it. So okay, you, found, you found your tribe, man. This is, everyone's getting it. Well, but I'll tell you who don't, the people that don't like me are people who are skewed to play the victim. Okay. Anyone who wants to hold on to their victim modality, I'm, I'm not their guy. Okay. I'm not their guy. But if someone is ready to suit up and shift and move things into habitability and inevitability, then I'm absolutely their guy. No, love it. All right. Who else? Sophia. Hello, Glenn. Thank you. You're welcome. I want to uh, announce publicly that I am mesmerized with your energy. Um, the first time I bathed in it was back in September 2016 when you spoke at uh, Tanya Waring's uh, Manifesting Mindset uh, event. Actually, oh, here in Dallas. Yes. Yes. And I opened that up. And that's when I met you for the first time and heard you for the first time. Like I said, mm. as my, I mean, I, so I'm admitting that I admire you. Oh, thank and, you, honey. And I learned a lot to, again, to put into my life. Um, but my question, the reason I, I wanted to um, uh, talk to you real quick is if this is personal, so you don't have to answer if you don't I'm not, to. I'm not afraid. Go. Okay. Um, when you were saying uh, you know, you stay up all night and, and you need to learn the lines or even maybe in production, you need to stay up on, on all night Yes. in Hollywood. I mean, I know how some people do it, but as you, as an actor, what do you specifically do to get through the not sleeping and still be on a thousand percent? I have a, I have an immediate answer for that. And it is called my energy itself rejuvenates me. Perfect. My joy quotient rejuvenates me. I do not find my life to be an exhausting life to live. I find it to be a joy. You know, depression needs a lot of sleep, yep. not because you're avoiding life. I mean, that's part of it. But the primary reason is it's exhausting to be depressed. So you're going to need more time in the rack. It is not exhausting to live my life. I can't wait to wake up. I'm excited. And I'm, I'm a big time night owl. So um, I, I'm accustomed to working on short sleep because 
passion will do for us whatever sleep doesn't. Mm -hmm. You know, and sleep is important. I'm not going to tell you we can do with just very, very little sleep. But I know this, I do not need as much sleep as most people. And the reason, if you know anything about the design of a car, mm -hmm. the alternator, the alternator does for the car what passion does for a human life. People who don't know the mechanics of cars don't realize the battery only serves to start the car. And yeah. once it's started, the car actually runs off of the alter alternator. And its job is to continue to replenish and keep the system charged. And that includes charging the battery. And it's doing it while it's running. So it's a perfect metaphor. Passion charges us while we're running. Yes. So if it makes any sense at all, Absolutely. I got a tremendous amount of rest during that talk I just gave. Yes, I understand that. I slept through it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm more rested than I was before I did it. I'm more energized, not worn out from it. Does so, that make so sense? Glenn, Glenn, are Absolutely. you saying that you don't get stressed out then if you have a big day planned and you're not able to sleep? You just, just go with no, it? No, because you know what? I really believe, Kyle, in the saying, well, that just happened. Meaning looking at the bed and go, I thought I was going to be in the rack for about six hours. It didn't go that way. That just happened. And then I'm done with it. Love it. Because I, 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 there's no, look, there's a reason that, that the rear, there's a reason that the windshield of life is friggin' this big and the rearview mirror is this big. There's a reason for that. Thank and you. I live my life in the, in the, you know, in the windshield and not up in the rearview mirror thinking about what could have been and I could have gotten more sleep and I didn't and it's a shame and therefore it's going to be a tough day and how am I going to get through this talk? And I've got, again, those are excuses to feel bad. They all fall under the heading of reasons to feel bad. Life is too short to be focused on reasons to feel bad. I want to spend my time during this dance focusing on reasons to celebrate, things to be grateful for, and reasons to smile and the opportunity to connect. And dwelling on how something didn't go the way I thought it would or hoped it would, a colossal waste of time. Love that. Sophia, thanks for the question. Thank uh, if anyone else has a question, and I really prefer, uh, and you guys have done great, so I'm not referring to what's past. I'm going into future. Uh, if you have a specific question for Glenn uh, versus previous experiences, and that that's not about what you said, Sophia, or anything, but uh, really want to just keep diving in deeper with Glenn if anyone has specific questions. Glenn, I have a question. Hey, Ken, your haircut looks fabulous. Was that your question is what is your opinion of my new haircut? <laughs> no, no. Um, you brought up and you, you, went, you went down a different uh, trail. You brought up the four tiered steps to making decisions. Oh. You didn't. You didn't and a, and a couple of people are asking. Okay, about that. thank I don't you. Know if you have the time or not. Kyle. No, of course I do, and I won't. I won't do a long thing on it. But thank you for reminding me. You know what happens is I'm getting so many downloads when when I start into one of my talks that sometimes I will open up. Oh, you and I do this in our friendship. We'll open up yes. a pop up window, and then we get excited about another thing. We open that one, that one, then we go, "Wow, we got to circle back because we we never yeah. address that third window." So when making great decisions. I think we were misled in the 70s when we were taught the phrase, well, it's about what you want, man. It's all about what you want. You got to think about what you want and just do what you want, man. Do what you feel, do what you want. That's level one. There are three decision levels that are higher than that and frankly, way more efficient. So uh, we want to get away from simply doing what we want. Now, I'm not, just stay with me before you react to that because there's good following this. So that's, that's level one is doing what you want. A higher level of decision making is to do what you want most. And I really want you to get the importance of that word and, and write that down if you would. So level one is doing what you want. Level two is doing what you want most, right? What you want most. And when you compare doing what you want with what do I want most, you'll see that it's quite easy to make a decision. And I wrote a chapter about it in a book called Gold Medal or Cheesecake. That's the name of the chapter. Gold Medal or Cheesecake. 
and it references someone I'm training to win the gold medal in track. And two days before time trials, they're scarfing out on a, a big, big container of haagen ice cream. And I walk up and say, sweetheart, um, I love haagen as well, but you told me you wanted my help in training you to win the gold. And I have one question to ask you right now. Is it going to be gold medal or cheesecake? Because the two do not dance together at this time. You want me to train you, you're going to have to sacrifice the cheesecake. And I got to tell you, I will make you a promise, which is that if and when you win the gold, I will order us all the cheesecake you can handle. And we will eat it together, but not now. So when you compare what you want most, gold medal or cheesecake, then all of a sudden it becomes a lot easier to set the cheesecake aside because your focus is on the gold medal. If you just do what you want, you'll wind up choosing the cheesecake because you're just doing what you want, man. You're doing what feels good. I'm in the mood to have some cheesecake. Level three is what outcome do you want? And believe me, that's way higher than the first two. So it starts with what do you want? Then it's what do you want most? Then what outcome, or here's another word, consequence, do you want? And the fourth and highest level, Ken, I got through this so fast. The fourth and highest level is what outcome do you want most? And when I say you, you're now talking about yourself. So it's I. You'll ask yourself, what outcome do I want most? I will tell you, there is not a better place in your life. So help me, God, to make a decision from than what outcome do I want most? Let me go through them real fast one more time. What do I want is number one. The next rung up on the ladder is what do I want most? The next rung up on the ladder is what outcome do I want? And level four is what outcome do I want most? And I will promise you, if you start from the desired outcome, so this is where knowing your death day self comes in really handy. Go to the desired outcome. What is the outcome? I forget about what I want. That's for grade school children. What is the outcome I want most? And you're going to have to teleport into the future for that outcome. What is the outcome I want here? And then rewind back. This is, again, a masterful use of this thing called imagination. You're going to revert back to today and in today decide, are my actions today in this moment, are they congruent with the stated outcome desired? And if they're not, they got to go bye-bye. They got to go away because they do not produce that outcome. So that's that one. So Glenn, my phone's blowing up with people just thanking me for having you on today. You Good. have really impacted people. If people want to get a hold of you or do you have any resources, yes. a place to send people? Yes. Let me tell them they can reach me and, and you're going to, first of all, catch your breath. There's still some of us on AOL. <laughs> okay. Sorry. So I'm going to give, give you an email address, which is Badipity, B as in boy, U, D as in dog, I. P as in Paul, I-T-Y at AOL.com. Ken just put it up in the chat room. It's badipity at AOL.com. Cool. Awesome. And I'll leave it for another question. If someone has a, another question, if you're good, Glenn, you tell I'm, me. Buddy, I, what am, we've got a virus going on. Yeah. Where do I have to be? <laughs> Any other questions for Glenn? I have, I have a quick one. Glenn, again, sure. thank you so much, man. Just My pleasure. Out. And, uh, you know, I, just, I had to go back and start watching 24 again. I'm on season three. Oh, nice. Let me back up. You know, had you, had you seen all eight seasons? I had huge fan. And now when I see you on there, I'm like, Hey kids, get in here. You need to see my friend Glenn. He's on TV again. But you're never going to be able to watch it the same brother. Cause every time you see it now, you're going to picture with, with baloney up my butt cheeks. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> You've, you said it a couple times now, and I wasn't quick enough. I'm taking so many pages of notes here. But sure. You're talking about your definition of the human experience. Yes. Would you say that one more time? Magnificent, Something. unrepeatable events in time behaving as if we're not. Every one of us, I want to, again, I'm going to give you a bonus word here. The word to write down regarding you. Okay. This, I'm going to, I'm going to actually put an, a triple asterisk by this, Kyle, and say, stay tuned. This is the single biggest takeaway. It's the biggest thing I'll give you all day. Write down the word event. 
because that's what every one of us are. We're an event. So here is, here is your um, call to action. All right. How many of you are ready for a really big call to action? You're an event. Act like it. That's the call to action. Act like it because you are one. Anything less was false coaching. Anyone who tried to tell you that you were anything other than a miraculous event, they did some really poor imprinting on you. So it's time to remember. Now, here's the other thing. You are not, and this is where we can get into megalomania and narcissism. There is a term I would like to coin called healthy narcissism. Every one of my students have it. The difference between healthy narcissism and textbook narcissism, which is an issue, that's a problem. It's very difficult to be around a true certifiable narcissist. Healthy narcissism knows that it, a narcissist thinks itself to be an event and nobody else is. A narcissist thinks that their feelings matter and nobody else's does. Healthy narcissism is when you get that you are an unrepeatable event in time, and here's the catch. So is everybody else. And all of your dealings with others are rooted in your desire to always be reminding them of their event-like nature and coming from love so that every dealing is designed to empower. It's not designed to dominate it's not designed to use. It's not designed to trick. It's not designed to manipulate. It's designed to love because that's what it wants in return. It wants to be loved. It wants to be supported. Therefore, in following the golden rule, we must love and support. That's the deal. I don't think I can offer you anything that is more important than that and the vast majority. And this is an assessment. It's not a judgment. The vast majority of people do not live their lives with being an event as a prevalent thought. Most Now, this differs in a group like Kyle's and in any kind of really driven circle, but you got to know that's a, different, that's a different set of folks. I'm talking about the average person walking down the street is not jumping up and down about the privilege of being alive. They're not elated to be here. It's like, yeah, you know, it's, it's okay. You know, it's like, oh, it's whatever. You know, we can hang out for a while and then we leave. But there are some of us who are jacked up about the beauty of life. How wonderful is it to look at a star-filled night and just really be at one with it? Like just sit there and behold and go, I get to be a part of this. Like it's, it's beautiful. So when the, when the beauties of life occur to you, we are transformed by that. And all we have to do is just become acknowledgers. We just have to become more conscious. It's the main thing we taught our kids. Wake up. My business card says we owe it to ourselves to wake up twice every day. The first one is like the rest of the world. The other one is when we get conscious. Now that we're already awake and we have our clothes on and we're dressed, now let's wake up even more. Glenn, this has been such a treat, uh, almost two hours. So incredible. Let's give Glenn another big hand, everyone. Thanks, buddy. Yeah. You got other people behind me. To see. Someone's taking a screenshot of us clapping uh, like the, you guys did yesterday. That's really cool. You're welcome. Glenn, um, definitely have an invite back. I'm really appreciate uh, you being with us, giving of yourself. We're about to take a break. And okay. Lisa Haysha coming up and uh, some other things. But before the day's over, we're going we're gonna to reflect on the things you said. And we're going to go through and let everyone kind of share with the group uh, some of the big takeaways. So, again, thank you so much. My pleasure. Appreciate it, my friend. Looking forward to connecting soon. Okay, brother.